Each one of the Black Ops 3 Zombies maps was part of an overall effort to redefine the formula of the mode, to reshape it into that Zombies 2.0. To that end, every map up until this point had been very different, but they did all have at least one thing in common. All of them had the depth and quest-focused design that defined this new era, but it was always grafted on top of the aesthetics or the design of one or two very specific maps from the past. Those reference points gave players an anchor to have something familiar to latch onto when they were going into these otherwise pretty dense experiences. So we got Shadows of Evil with a very unique setting, but the gameplay was very much Origins crossed with Mob of the Dead. On the other hand, the Reisendrache pulled almost all of its iconic visuals basically unchanged from Duris and Moon. Then Zetsubo no Shima felt almost like a direct sequel to Shinonuma. It's reductive to just look at maps in terms of what similarities they share with past entries because they all did have their own twists on the formula and they all added something to the mode in their own way. But at the same time, there had started to be a pattern of being able to play a new map and within 5 minutes be able to point out a single old map it's almost a new version of. Gorod Krovi was the first one to break them out of that rut. It did still have that same sense of familiarity, but it didn't get it from explicit callbacks to singular points of reference. Instead, it was more that it conveyed the feeling of playing a classic map, with more general design elements while still standing on its own and not being tied to anything specific. If you're trying to pick an entry point where a classic player can get a foothold into the Black Ops 3 ecosystem, the Reisendrache is the obvious choice, just because of the raw amount of in-your-face nostalgia. But Gorod Krovi took a bit of a different approach and works on a different level. It was the map that, based on its own merit and not using any cheap tricks, actually feels the most like playing a Black Ops 1 map ported into the modern era been known by many names, but I know it as Stalingrad, City of Blood. The first big step to making that work was reprioritizing the mystery box after a lot of the changes that Black Ops 3 had made ended up destroying a lot of its value. In the past, it used to be the only place you could get any weapons that were actually good at killing. Wall guns were, for the most part, rifles or SMGs or shotguns, just things to get you through the early rounds before you got your real gun. In contrast, in all the Black Ops 3 maps, you could buy assault rifles like the M8A7 or the KN44 off the wall whenever you wanted. There was no reason to gamble when, for the price of less than two spins, you could just buy a guaranteed good mid-round option. You didn't even need the box for the high rounds either, because with the introduction of double pack-a-punch and alternate ammo types, those same wall guns could now carry you infinitely deep into a game. Even if you wanted a true main map wonder weapon, those hadn't been in the box since Buried. Not including the giant, only because it was a remake of an earlier design. On Kino der Toten, the Thunder Gun was the Holy Grail. No matter which four players you got together, every one of them would have no problem spending tens of thousands of points spinning for it. It was just worth it, especially because you'd probably get a good secondary like an LMG or a Galil on the way. In Black Ops 3, the most exciting thing you can see come up in the box is maybe monkeys. By the time you've opened up the map and have enough points to start spinning the box consistently, you could easily have already built the Wrath of the Ancients or the KT-4 completely independently. Gorod Krovi took at least that part back to basics. The big, exciting new wonder weapon was back to being purely a lucky spin of the box with no way to build it even if you wanted to. That did end up taking some agency away from the player, and it meant that some games had worse RNG and might feel worse as a result. But it had been long enough that it also felt fresh, and it made it fun to gamble again because you knew there was something that was both totally unobtainable and super powerful in there. The GKZ-45 Mark III was an amalgamation of two separate wonder weapons, a bit like the Wave and Zap guns from Moon. But instead of switching between forms, you dual wielded both of the guns, so you could use them independently, but also simultaneously. In your right hand, you got the Raygun Mark III, which was pretty similar to the Mark II, with the same precision, headshot multiplied, high penetration shots. 
Then, in your left hand, you got a new gun that fired out a closer range, area of effect cloud that slowed any zombies that walked through it to almost a complete stop. Even though it has literally zero killing power, that effect is actually perfectly placed on this map specifically. The easter egg has multiple steps where you need to escort NPCs around the map without killing them, and zombies are infinitely spawning around you while you do it. Everything you kill just spawns back in further ahead on the path and makes your life harder down the line. But if you instead gather everything up and slow them down non-lethally instead, you can leave them behind you and go ahead with the path completely clear. And while they each had those individual effects, and you could just effectively use them as two separate guns, they also had a synergistic effect. If you hit an existing slowness cloud with a Mark III shot, it overloads it and turns it into a black hole that does do massive damage to zombies in that same area of effect. Now, if that was the only change to the box, just that the Wonder Weapon was in there, that still wouldn't fully fix the problem of that gamble just not being fun anymore. That would make hitting the box basically required again, but 29 times out of 30, you'd get something that felt like a waste of money because, again, you're already happy with what you have. The only bright side is that one wonder weapon. At its core, that's just forcing a repeatedly disappointing experience on the player, and when they hit that single jackpot, they breathe a sigh of relief and never engage with that system again. So, to have more of a balance of ups and downs, and have those more mid-range things to excite you on the way to getting the Wonder Weapon, they added a couple other things to the rotation. A lot of them were exciting because they appealed directly to the nostalgia of that Black Ops 1 audience. You could get the FFAR, which was basically the same thing as the old FAMAS, or going even further back, the best point gun of all time, the PPSH return, for the first time since World at War. The Shadow Claws were a set of crossbows that, when pack-a-punched, got the Ballistic Knife's ability to revive players with the projectile. Those kind of upgrades that fundamentally changed how a gun operated beyond just increasing stats had been mostly missing from the last two games outside of a couple very specific examples. Things like the Awful Lawton's Distraction Shots, or the AUG getting a shotgun as an attachment. That pack-a-punch potential meant that even though the Shadow Claws were terrible for getting kills, a player who was looking to play Medic could still get excited to see them come up. Beyond just the nostalgia hits, there were other box exclusives that were just independently good, again to help make that gamble fun again. There was the L4 Siege, a launcher you could be super mobile with, which made it perfect for both phases of the boss fight. And Monkey Bombs were a mainstay, they had always been good to get. This time, they had even more potential because they had a side easter egg to upgrade them, so they acted a bit more like the Lil Arnies. After that, they pulsed and killed zombies throughout their whole lifetime instead of just one single explosion at the end. As a bonus, because that upgrade was coded as a pack-a-punch, you could skip that whole quest with one of the new gobblegums introduced in this DLC. After the changes to the box, the next big step for building a map with Black Ops 1 sensibilities was addressing the complexity that was so controversial in all of Black Ops 3. The developers didn't want the solution to just be to remove that depth entirely, because that's what this new era of zombies was, it's the foundation of the entire concept. Gorod Krovi wasn't literally supposed to be a Black Ops 1 map, it was still supposed to be modern, just in a way that re-examined those early entries and folded back in some of those design elements. So they didn't actually remove any of those gameplay layers. The map still had all those hidden, discoverable little secrets that augmented your gameplay in a bunch of different ways. And, because of the time trial system, more than any other map in history, there was a ton of space for you to tangibly improve and express mastery over time. To make that still existing depth more palatable, what they did was avoid the middle ground where all the complexity was surfaced to the player, but also left just vague enough that they didn't know how to get started. In Gorod Krovi, it felt like everything had moved to one of two extremes. They either made the cause and effect of a system super explicit and really easy to understand, or they went the other direction and made it truly hidden. They were trying to avoid the situation where a first time player gets halfway down a bunch of different side quests and gets frustrated because they have so much going on and they don't know what they're actually expected to be solving. Just comparing the inventory screens of this versus Zetsubo no Shima, you can see that right away. 
Hitting the back button on this map is so much less overwhelming, especially when you realize that over half the space is dedicated just to a detailed description of unlocking Pack-a-Punch. The Mark III is in the box, and they don't show you any side buildables like a gas mask, so the only thing that screen asks of the player is to build the shield. Then, Zombies players had gotten used to there not being labels on interactables and having to blindly press buttons on the environment to make things happen. But here, in multiple different places, there was that explicit UI text explaining exactly what things did to make some of the more important elements less ambiguous. When you pick up a code cylinder for a graph module, you get an unmissable pop-up telling you exactly where you need to take it to be able to trigger that Zetsubo-style altar defense that will get you a pack-a-punch piece. If they wanted to leave that out, they could have gotten away with it. The cylinders were already color-coordinated to match their machines, so it would have been on par with something like Shadows of Evil. But because it was part of Pack-a-Punch, which is really a fundamental part of any map, they kept away from that level of obscurity. And that way, the process for unlocking the weapon upgrade system was back to being rooted in a very classic go to the three corners of the map and press a button, like the very earliest days of Doris and Ascension. There were the added complications of actually getting the cylinder and then going and doing the defenses, but those felt like small and natural enough extensions to that formula, and importantly, they were very transparent with that overlaid UI text and the glowing green beacons guiding you around. The specialist weapon has the same thing, those challenges from Zetsubo returned, and each player gets a randomized set of four. Three of them gave basically the same rewards as last time, a max ammo, a selection of guns, and a random perk bottle, but the fourth one wasn't random. Instead, it was a detailed, plain text description of every step to unlocking that last part of your arsenal. This time, you didn't need to poke around at all the different systems of the map and see what responded, you could just straight up read that now you needed to kill napalm zombies. For that, you got the specialist with the most variety in functionality to that point. The Gauntlet of Siegfried gave you a living pet dragon that you could keep on your wrist as a flamethrower, which also let you use its bite as a melee, which was stronger than a bowie knife. Or you could choose to launch it and let it fly around as an autonomous sentry, getting kills on its own, which left you with a rocket punch that could boost you through a horde to avoid getting cornered. Just like everything else on the map, that depth was still there. There was still that variety to let you express yourself and react in the moment and develop strategies. It's just that in some cases, the steps to get to the point where that was an option were made a bit more accessible. On the other hand, the developers didn't want to lay every little feature out in plain text like that. One, because that would have been overwhelming in itself, and two, because those objectives that aren't as explicit, that the community has to put in work to investigate and discover over time, are a huge part of the draw of the mode. So, again, what they did for the rest was make sure that they were hidden or locked away somehow so players couldn't stumble across them before they were ready. The main easter egg was obviously a big one, there still weren't any hints there, it wasn't World War II or Cold War level with objectives yet. The Dragon Strike and the Shield could both be upgraded, but you couldn't do it until you found hidden symbols and items around the map that only showed up when you hit hidden usage requirements. Or there were the wearables, with three separate pieces of equipment to unlock by surviving tough situations, or using different systems, or getting precision shots on different enemies. This was the first time there had ever been multiple on a single map, but you could still only wear one at a time, so it was less of an objective upgrade like the Margwa hat or the Panzer helmet. Instead, it became a more tactical part of your arsenal, where you could swap between different ones depending on the situation or your playstyle. If you were leaving to do the lockdown, you might grab the Mangler helmet on the way to do more damage to and take less damage from those tough enemies since you knew you'd be seeing a lot of them. Then, once you finished and you got back, you might swap to the Valkyrie hat so you could do the same thing for those other special enemies if you were having trouble during their max ammo rounds. Or the Dragon Wings gave you resistance to all fire damage, let you get your team a free ride to Pack-a-Punch, and let you teleport yourself straight there instead of having to go through that unskippable cutscene. 
Correspondingly, they were the most involved to get, being gated behind getting the specialist, doing that lockdown, and flying around the map multiple times. But the important thing there is there was no checklist for doing any of that. The fact that those were all requirements for getting the dragon wings wasn't surfaced to the player in any way. There isn't even a conspicuous, empty space in the environment that might hint that something will go there in the future. All three wearables just get dropped in right on top of mannequins that don't look out of place where they are from the start. Just one random game, when you happened to do all these things, the wearable would just show up and blow your mind. Any of them realistically could have been designed as a buildable, with the requirements, or at the very least, the constituent parts listed on the inventory screen. But then, getting them isn't as exciting, you feel like you're just filling out a checklist, just doing the prescribed setup that the developers intended, that everyone else is already doing. If they just randomly appear one day, then they give the player, and by extension the whole community, that sense of mystique, and it makes everyone wonder what else could be out there. You felt like you had broken the game and gotten one over on the developers, or at the very least you were in on something with them. Obviously, they were all very intentional and just as carefully crafted as everything else in the game, but just that difference in presentation can really change how players interpret something. And kind of tangentially related to that idea of hiding things from the player was the way some features were gated a bit more strictly. Maybe some things weren't totally invisible, but at least they'd be structured in a way so that a new player couldn't get too far down a convoluted side quest before they'd done the basics. A big example there was, again, the Gauntlet of Siegfried. You physically couldn't get started on it until you'd unlocked Pack-a-Punch, because the first step took place in that isolated location. The beauty of Gorod Krovi is that it's more than just a great throwback map that hides away some of its complexity in order to be a bit more like Black Ops 1. It was how it looked backwards, but also forwards simultaneously, and in all those callbacks, it also layered in new advancements and added things to the mode. Speaking of things being hidden, maybe the biggest focus of the map was almost completely invisible to players until they really started to put the time in and master it. The only hint that they were tracking something new was that there was a timer counting up in the inventory screen. Behind the scenes, there was a ton of focus put on rewarding players for speed, which really hadn't been a variable you needed to consider before, outside of a couple isolated subsystems like the Pentagon Thief or singular, retriable steps of easter eggs. Before now, you had always been able to chip away at the zombies at your own pace. With them not having regenerating health, and the only progression gate being a fixed number of kills, there's literally no downside to taking some time to reposition to a new location, or spending some time gathering zombies up to make a more efficient train, or making a crawler and going around doing easter egg steps and getting perks and ammo and new weapons. You could play this map that way too, at its core it still had that same foundation. But, optionally, rounds 5, 10, 15, and 20 all had a par time attached. If you got there faster, you unlocked progressively better and better wall buys for melee weapons that you couldn't get any other way. The best one, the reward for beating the round 20 time, was a one-hit kill until the mid-30s, as good as the upgraded one-inch punch from Origins that you had to do the entire easter egg to get. Even the most basic one from the round 5 challenge was pretty good, with it being about the same as a bowie knife, but only costing 100 instead of 3000. But still, the rewards themselves weren't something you realistically wanted or desperately needed every single game. They were more just the justification for the system to exist, and that system served to get players thinking about that concept, and it gave them the option to impose that playstyle on themselves, more for the sake of it than anything else. It wasn't just that isolated time attack system that brought that pressure either, the map was a big exploration of that idea, and it integrated it in multiple different ways. The easter egg had it built in, with the bomb step being a high stakes version of the classic Samantha says, but this time, if you took too long or made a single mistake, every player in the game could be instantly downed and your whole game would just immediately end. And the reward for beating the entire thing was that every player got gifted every perk for free. Usually that's all it was, if you went down you still lost them just like if you had bought them. 
But if you speed run the Easter egg and finish it in less than 115 minutes, 115, those perks become permanent and you can't lose them in any way, like the ones on Moon. Since there was a Der Wunderfiz on the map, solo players could also use that to get easy infinite quick revives, so that as a reward was worth the effort it took to do the speedrun. Matching really well with that was the way most of the steps came in a randomized order, too. Finishing the easter egg wasn't just a matter of memorizing a set path, you had to be able to react on your feet and be ready to do any given trophy challenge at all times. That made the speedrun a real test of your skill and knowledge of the map instead of just your ability to memorize a single set route. The game as a whole being timed adds a ton of interesting complexities into the formula. There's just the foundation of how it tests your mastery of the game and the map, you have to know the best route to go to get all the upgrades, you have to know where to stand to efficiently kill zombies, and you have to be able to survive under that pressure and while you're executing all those strategies. But on top of requiring you to just be good, it also subtly changes how you have to play the game itself. It definitely gives you a lot less freedom to reset to max power, so you're very rarely fully stocked. If you run out of ammo mid-round, it can cost you almost a minute to leave your spot and go get more off the wall. It's a lot more efficient to swap to something new that's closer, or hit the box and take the first thing that comes up instead of hitting over and over again waiting for some perfect spin. A lot more variety gets forced onto you just by the nature of having to take whatever you can get. It also acts as a difficulty modifier. You'll spend more time with less perks because you have to work your way over to them during the action of the round instead of being able to make a crawler and grab them the second you have enough points. During a run to round 20, you definitely won't have enough time for a trip to Pack-a-Punch. This map is almost specifically designed to discourage that with the 35 second unskippable cutscene between you and the machine. So, you're trying to do something that's more difficult than just basic survival, with guns that probably aren't your favorite, and what you do have you can't even upgrade. Like they do everywhere else, the Mega Gobblegums do invalidate a lot of that challenge with ones that let you instantly upgrade your gun, or get all of the perks right at the start of the game, or even straight up skip rounds entirely to artificially lower the goal you're going for. That's not really the end of the world though, because the challenge was already for the most part self-driven. You already had to choose to put that challenge on yourself, so part of that decision was just also choosing to ignore the overpowered gums if you did want that difficulty increase. Then, the last great microcosm of how the map was such a marriage of old and new was, of course, the story and all the aesthetics that decorated it. Same as Der Eisendrache, it was very deeply rooted in the Black Ops 1 era, and it brought a lot of elements back from then. But then, where that map kind of just let those elements sit as is, this one worked to expand on them and tried to convert them to the Black Ops 3 level of depth, and in some cases, even into the new genre. To round out the collection of Ultimus-focused maps, this time the Origins crew literally fell into Stalingrad, Russia to deal with the original Nikolai. He's the only one of the old characters that's both awake and interacting with the players the entire time, so from the very beginning, he's being his stereotypical self, talking about the glory of the motherland and how his only friend is vodka. So, when that Black Ops 3 turn happens and adds that depth, that means that within this map there's a self-contained visible arc. You can watch the transition from stereotype to actual character in real time. In the end cutscene, they retcon that his alcoholism and all of his talk about killing his many wives was just a defense mechanism for coping with the real wartime death of his one actual wife that he did love. Same as with Takio, they took what was originally just a shorthand for creating a very intentional caricature and uncovered a deeper character underneath and gave this map a real sense of tragedy. You can see that same approach in another, smaller character too, in Sophia. She was a character who was mentioned on a single radio back under Reese just because they needed a random name for Maxis's assistant to complete a radio and they pulled one out of a hat. 
Seven years down the line, when they needed a central personality for this map, instead of making up something totally new, they pulled that name back out and turned it into something fully realized. The writers got to explore the space they wanted and make something that was basically new, but it was still rooted in that early era. And it wasn't just the characters either, they took that same path with the setting. At its foundation, it would have been right at home in World at War, with the Battle of Stalingrad already being in that game, and that would have been perfect for that era because maps were being pulled almost unchanged from campaign environments. The mid-game set piece, kind of the equivalent to the spider fight from Zetsubo, was the lockdown that made the Dragon Strikes available, the distracting air support that was a lot like the Origins G-Strikes. You had to put yourself in a bunker with no way to get out except by killing all of the waves of enemies coming at you. It was a really cinematic set piece, and it was pretty much a 50-50 blend of a campaign mission and the locked down horror that defined Nocturne Toten right at the very beginning of the mode. With it being set in Russia, there were a couple nods to Ascension too, since it was the other map that took place there from way back then. It wasn't to the point that it made it feel like a complete sequel like Zetsubo no Shima did for Shinonuma. Aesthetically, it was super different, a space age rocket launch site versus a World War II battlefield full of rubble. Even down to the lighting, it's a literal night and day difference. But they still snuck in a couple quick references. Sophia's codename for the easter egg was the Ascension Protocol, and one of the steps was to recapture Gersh's lost soul orb, the same one we set free in that very first easter egg. He even has voice lines talking about how he recognizes the player characters from the Cosmodrome. And the secondary effect of the Wonder Weapon of creating a black hole was really evocative of the Gersh device, the tactical equipment that was introduced on that map. So it had a foundation that was evocative of the early era, but it was vague enough and pulling from enough different sources that it felt like a part of that canon without being derivative. Then, again, like with everything else, they built evolutions on top of that foundation to bring it up to the scope and scale of the rest of Black Ops 3. Here, flying above that grounded World War II battlefield, were dragons. No abstractions or making some kind of similar looking creature, just straight up dragons right out of a fantasy novel. On top of all the theming, with the dragon scale shield and the specialist weapon and the dragon strikes, they were also a big part of the gameplay, with them perching every once in a while to breathe fire over the easiest areas to train in to keep you moving and making sure that you're not just camping in one spot. They were actually overtuned a bit to give some room for players to be able to earn rewards to lessen their impact. The shield passively made you fireproof, and the other big reward for the easter egg was killing the dragon that did that during the boss fight, which meant that it wouldn't happen for the rest of the match. The existence of dragons was hinted at in the Wolf King's castle and in Division 9's secret lab, but seeing them in the flesh, in gameplay, and playing through the aftermath of their battles with the giant Soviet mechs really hammers home how much the setting and the atmosphere of the mode had changed. Not necessarily for the worse, but it was just so much more loud and bombastic about all of its big decisions. This map was probably the best example of that. The intro was even set to Motorhead to really set the tone. It was unashamed of being heavy metal, high energy, in your face, epic scale action. So it's appropriate that this is the first appearance of the personification of the complexity of the Black Ops 3 story. At about round 15, an ominous voice starts to talk to you telepathically, and then at the end of the easter egg, he introduces himself as Dr. Monty. There were audio logs around the map where he tried to make some sense out of the multiversal timeline, but even he was having audible trouble understanding it. He explained how killing Richtofen at the giant had caused the fracturing of the multiverse, and how all the different versions of the characters are kind of different, but also their destinies are all somehow intertwined. And he referenced how this new storyline started with Origins, and how it was about to end in the next map. There were actually a bunch of hints for revelations, there was a very intentional effort here to start building up hype for a big finale. There were pianos with sheet music that had that name on it, 
Hidden notes talk about what would end up being the end cutscene of that map, with four time-traveling knights wielding staffs. And the easter egg cutscene for this map ends with a teaser that starts with not just to be continued, but concluded with a name reveal and everything. That level of explicit advertising for the next thing was pretty unprecedented for the mode outside of a couple very subtle hints like the Darice cork boards and they kept that going in the marketing over the next couple months. It was so extreme that it honestly might have hurt Revelations in the end. It was objectively the most hyped up map in the history of the mode, and no matter how good it is at what it's trying to do, fans had those huge expectations of the ultimate, perfect finale to compare it to. Since this video is about Gorod Krovi though, at this point the community was still in that pure hype phase, and investment in the story as an equal to the gameplay was at an all time high. It was the polar opposite of the way things were back in 2010, when only the most diehard fans knew or cared about Richtofen being in the Illuminati, or what the Vril Yaw were. Gorod Krovi was very undeniably a Black Ops 3 map in all of its depth, with both that story stuff and with the gameplay. But taking that analytical eye away and just jumping in and actually playing it, more than anything, you feel that Black Ops 1 core shining through. It wasn't just that the wonder weapon was in the box, or that the process for unlocking Pack-a-Punch was going to the three corners of the map, or even that it took place in a building during World War II. It was that there was a holistic design philosophy across the entire map to divide that Zombies 2.0 level of depth into more distinct and digestible layers. If you wanted, you could play Gorod Krovi without engaging with any of the advanced systems, the same way you would have if it had come out right after Call of the Dead. Turn on power, unlock Pack-a-Punch, and then you can just train into the high rounds with all the best weapons being from the box. Der Eisendrache was the other map that went for this more accessible route, but even it didn't go that far. Feeding the dragon heads isn't hard to do, but it is something, another parallel system above and beyond the basics. And it was one that you needed to engage with to get the wonder weapon, which really is a part of that core experience. In Gorod Krovi, that core was untouchable, and it existed in a pure, distilled form at the forefront. Then, all of the depth was built around it. Secret pieces of equipment that are tailored to help with each individual challenge the map has to offer, or time trials that let you show off your mastery, and enemies that could just be bullet sponges, but if you knew just how to shoot them, you could cripple them or bring them down way easier. It made for the most customizable experience to date, where every player could choose exactly how they wanted to play. More than ever, the full spectrum of playstyles was viable. The most basic run and gunner won't get overwhelmed, but there is enough there for them to have a rewarding and fully realized experience. And there's also enough there for the player who's watching hundreds of YouTube videos to really sink their teeth into. It's familiar, but not too much. It fits right in with the rest of Black Ops 3, where every map has its own unique vibe and almost represents its own unique genre. Revelations was next, and it was designed to be purely a love letter to everything that had come before. It was a bombastic send-off where they threw in everything they could think of and very actively put fun over balance. Here, with their last chance to make something a bit more intentional and crafted, they still chose to make another love letter, just of a bit of a different kind. It was the map that felt the most like a genuine, earnest merger of their history and the modern era. Something that had all the conveniences and depth it needed to not feel like a step backwards and still feel fully realized, but that still highlighted the strength of that core game loop one last time. So